so we are recording. Um, so JP, I got us. You know, I told you before um, we hit the record button that I'm excited. It was only a matter of time before I use this office for really what was it, what it was intended for, and this this desk, and that you know you can say that hey, I was the first one to record in Ian's office on the desk of science with the, the, the two cameras set up and uh, with the new equipment. So, yeah, it's good to have you. Yeah, thank you for having me. I love the setup. Thanks. Obviously, it's very nice. Thanks. And, you know, I hope that, you know, we spoke about before how, you know, I kind of came upon this equipment. Um, I look forward to using it decades to come to, you know, do what we're both passionate about. And, yeah. You know, giving people this information on lifestyle and diet and, you know, change the world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're given the grant for a reason, right? <laughs> right. I, well, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I guess if I didn't have, again, when I at the, the time when I applied, I had, you know, I think about 50 episodes in the bank. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they looked at those things and said, you know, this kid, he's uh, he's he's taking this stuff pretty seriously. So, so why don't you start with why don't you tell people a little bit about you and maybe <clears throat> like how I'm trying to think how we met. Did we met through? Did we meet through Matt Brophy? Or do we meet before oh, that? Oh, man. So, so, you know, tell people about both your educational background, okay. cycling background, how we know each other, what we kind of have in common. Okay. You can go over there. So I think, I, I do think we met specifically through Matt. Mm -hmm. um, actually, we met the day his accident happened because you were the mm. first person to come over. I didn't realize you were there. Yeah. Um, I was the, the skinny little scrawny kid right next to him <laughs> asking if he was okay while you were assisting him on yeah, the ground yeah um you're wearing the miami university jersey right i think i might okay. have been yeah, yeah yeah so that was the first time i officially met you but I, we definitely are reintroduced in the the plant-based cyclist setting mm. through matt brophy yeah yeah um but yeah i mean it's been a good few years we've been riding together and racing together a little bit um as far as my uh, background I graduated with a degree in exercise science um, I did a lot with strength and conditioning focused primarily on injury prevention and uh, we'll say like biomechanical analysis I would watch people's forms for different activities such as jumping and running and try to find the inefficiencies and improve them for maximal power or efficiency mm -hmm. um, I have a few certifications in nutrition, and I used to do presentations on the starch-based solution by John McDougall. Um, that was kind of where I came into the, the plant-based scene initially. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've been trying to do my best since then, and more currently, I've worked in an emergency room for the past six years as a, as a tech, more or less, and as a scribe, so doing all the little typing and documenting that all the doctors look forward to not having to do mm -hmm. with the hopes so you work there with the hopes that it would turn into something else or with the hopes of uh, that experience helping with uh, something you plan to go into yes so this the scribe position is very good because the doctors dictate or give you a little freedom to put in the information that you you are seeing them either do on a physical exam or if they make a phone call you can put in that information yourself. Mm -hmm. It depends on who you work with, but it's a great it's a great way to learn as much as possible in a small amount of time. Yeah. Because, so you, go ahead. Uh, I mean, the doctor goes into the room and they're listening to their heart and you know what they're listening for and they're going to say okay or uh like heart regular rate and rhythm or two over six systolic murmur, mm -hmm. just little things that you pick up over time. And then it's like, oh, what does that mean? Yeah. And, and, then, then, and then when you're in school, you say, I've heard that before. Yeah. You have this experience. Yeah. So now is there as much freedom for you in this position as a scribe to like ask questions and be like, you know, if there were students, because we have a lot of students in the orthopedic clinic that are coming from like SUNY Brockport, athletic mm -hmm. training students who um, shadow. And so we kind of know who they are and we give them some some latitude to ask a lot of questions. Is there as much of that for you in the ER with like with these doctors and nurses or are you do you kind of like stay quiet? Absolutely. Some of the doctors really take it upon themselves to try to teach you hmm. as much as they possibly can so an x-ray will come back and they'll be like take a look tell me what what you see and it's like can you see what i'm looking for it's like oh i see that there's an opacity right there they're like mm. oh good pickup cool they're like so what would your differentials be for right. that it's like i'm not a doctor but <laughs> it's pretty cool they 
some of them really try to get you involved and make it as fun for us with our, our low pay as possible with, with uh, and instead by giving us as much education as possible. That's good. That's yeah. nice. And so, so you, you've made it apparent to, to, to some of them at least that you hope to go on with your medical career in, in doing, and maybe this will be a good transition into doing, uh, into doing what? Um, so part of the stuff we're going to talk about today was my frustration with medicine itself, but yeah, into some sort of medicine. I know that me personally, I need chaos and pressure and loud noises and, and all kinds of hoopla to, to kind of be excited about medicine and trauma and emergencies. So I know that that specific setting works very, very well for my personality and in situations where I thrive at the highest level. So initially I wanted to specifically just pursue med school to become an emergency physician and then kind of frustration with the same things over and over again. The fact that 90% of the stuff that comes in to the emergency room is not an emergency Mm -hmm. and also probably preventable yeah in various aspects so yeah and i, I want to i definitely want to you know take that and run with it but i just i just want to ask one more follow up while we're here is how did you know that you thrived on chaos and and you know excitement it it started when i volunteered at a small hospital in st louis it was uh, part of the ssm system uh it was ssm st joseph in st charles missouri um I had interest in kind of seeing what a doctor di- does, and I got to see a uh, cabbage, which is a coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Mm. And when they started the surgery and just um, kind of seeing that stuff, it was incredible. I mean, seeing seeing a live beating heart inside someone's chest it's crazy is it's a f- it's a feeling that you you can't really describe or mimic or unless someone else has kind of seen that it's, it's, it's just, it's such a wow moment. Yeah. And from that I had interest. So I asked if I could volunteer in the emergency room. Um, and the first time, uh, a STEMI, which is a, a specific type of heart attack, uh, came into the emergency room and just everything going on. And it just, in a way it, it felt, calming and Mm. peaceful and some people run around frantic and freak out but I just had moments of clarity and relaxation just felt like I I really belonged in that moment and what was going on Mm. um it's counterintuitive yeah it it was kind of the first time in my life that I had a moment where I was like you know this definitely really makes sense for what I need as a as as a personality and a person Mm. so I kind of ran with it from there and worked mm-hmm. as a tech, and then, so good for you. The next time something like that came in, I was the person doing CPR, and wow. So it definitely progressed, and now I'm the person doing the documenting. So I've cool. been around pretty much every position except for a nurse and a doctor. So. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I've been certified now for eight years as an athletic trainer, and it's kind of more of a matter of when, not if, mm-hmm. I will do CPR. But yep. man, knock on wood. I have yet to do CPR on any athletes or any patients like that. So that's that's uh, some good experience, yeah, for sure. Um, so let's so let's transition into what you see a lot of, what you have seen a lot of in these um, emergency room settings that um, you know that are, like you said, kind of preventable, that are largely diet and lifestyle related. So. I don't, I don't remember if it was 2016 or 2017, but they released the, the three most common chief complaints in an emergency room setting, and it was chest pain, abdominal pain, and back pain. And most of the back pains, from what I gathered reading this article, were related to non, non, non-traumatic instances of where people just woke up, it's like, oh, I have this pain, or I'm walking, I have this pain, or pain that kind of came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and most of the time, it led to something that was like a sciatica, or a disc herniation, or some type of numbness that was pinching at a nerve at some point. Um, the abdominal pains usually range from 
almost all of the abdominal pains that come in are preventable. The cholecystitis, the gallbladder inflammation, mm-hmm. the IBS, mm-hmm. um, the colitis, the gastritis, the gastroenteritis. Kidney pain. Yep. <laughs> Pyelonephritis, <laughs> UTIs, the stuff that goes much further than just basic hygiene for your body, what you eat, what you put in it. But And then, don't even get me started on the chest pains. I mean, almost all of the chest pains are... It's not just like a genetic cause. It's it's solely related to like a atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis or coronary artery disease or mm-hmm. some some chronic pathology in the arteries that's getting progressively worse mm-hmm. and which can lead to like even from the heart. Then you have like PVD, which is peripheral venous um, disorder. However, people want to say it. they say it a few different ways, but essentially you don't get adequate blood flow through different parts of your body so you don't have strong pulses in your legs and then you can get clots Mm -hmm. so every everything comes back to some level of lifestyle and exercise and physical health mental health stress Mm -hmm. i've seen people come in that are about as healthy as can be and they had a heart attack and they were Mm -hmm. just more stressed recently Mm -hmm. they live a healthy there's just so many factors but Mm -hmm. uh i definitely would say the staple is that 90% of them would, would be preventable on any given day. Yeah. Um, but how much of what you see, I mean, I'm imagining I, I did a stint in, uh, Hornell's emergency room. Mm -hmm. I think they had like 10 or 12 beds. So it was super small. Oh, wow. (laughs) But, um, I did like a hundred hours over the course of, uh, the spring semester of my senior year. And like, I saw a couple people die. Yeah. Like yep. really like old. I remember this one woman, she was like in her mid nineties and man, did she look like death? Yeah. She looked like, and it was really an eye opening experience. But anyway, so I, I digress is I imagine though, but in, in the emergency department, um, that isn't really the time or place to say to this patient, you know, after they've recovered if they've recovered from this heart attack to the point where they're conscious, maybe they had a coronary artery bypass that's not the place to say, oh, by the way, change your diet, right? That doesn't really happen there. It's it's such a hard setting for that to be even a component because emergency is so unpredictable. You can I can go in one day to work, and there's two patients waiting to be seen, and we see eight patients for a 12-hour shift. The next day we can go in, and there's 40 people waiting to be seen that are chest pains and acute processes and their x-rays come back and they have pneumonias or pulmonary emboli mm. or a pneumothorax with their lungs collapsing. So it, it just really, the environment is hard to set up, set up a system to where we can even take the time right. to right. kind of be like, hey, also, I know you just had a heart attack and we saved your life and brought you back and you're barely conscious, but yeah. you should change your lifestyle. And remind me, is this is this that strong or uh, Rochester Regional? I am at it's out of the the RH system, so I work at RGH and uh, Unity. Okay, in Greece. Okay, so I guess what what are your suggestions for helping these people um, prevent something like this from ever happening again, or their loved ones if they happen to be listening to this or watching this, or someone out there who w- really wants to prevent this stuff happening to them? Like what resources are out there that they can utilize to prevent this stuff from happening? That's a hard question in itself just because there's so many good resources on, on stuff you can do for lifestyle changes. Um, plenty of resources for, for like mental health awareness and how to take care of your stress in your life. And, um, plant-based nutrition obviously is a huge component. That's Mm -hmm. why we're both here. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as from this specific setting, it's it's hard to pinpoint one specific thing um, just because there's so many resources available. It's hard for someone to just type in something and then pick something. There's not one specific website that people know that they can go to. Yeah. But what are some good, I mean, if you, so what, 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 in your opinion, in your personal, your personal feelings, what are some really good ones in your eyes that, so, that you would point people to? For basic lifestyle changes, I think any lifestyle medicine um, practicing group is really good. The one in Rochester is really good Mm. with Ted Barnett. Yeah. He's an incredible guy. Um, 
the Starch Solution is great. John McDougall through yep. my certifications. Um, um, Esselstyn, mm -hmm. um, Campbell. Yep. Um, Thomas Campbell in Rochester True. here is great. Yep. Rochester actually has a really good setup for yeah. <laughs> plant-based nutrition. You don't yeah. really realize it until you look at the, the vegan and whole foods plant-based friendly providers list. Yep. Yeah. It's it's massive. Now, what's that providers list? What are you talking about? So on, oh, I don't know if it's plantpower.com or something, but they have a list of various plant-friendly oh, and yeah. plant-educated, plant-based nutrition educated providers list. Yeah. The Rochester one has like 40 or 50 yeah. people on it. No, I, I think it's so, that's through, I, I know one of them is through the Plantrition Project. Okay. I just interviewed one of the co-founders of that, Scott Stoll. Mm -hmm. Um, so the Plantrition Project is kind of, he, he did it, it's more of a resource for doctors yep. to learn more about plant-based nutrition after they've graduated from, from medical school or from residency. And they have this tool where you can type in your zip code and it comes up all of the plant-based providers in your area who are with it and who, who understand what plant-based nutrition is and who want to get you off of your medications. I also think there's, I think you can get there, for, it's like plantbaseddocs.com or something okay. like that, but just Google it. Okay. Um, I think all those resources that you just spoke about are good resources, good names, good, you know, and, and pretty much everyone you mentioned has written a book or two. Yeah, um, <laughs> at least. Michael Greger is another good one, nutritionfacts.org. Yep, yep. um, he doesn't really have like the programs where, you know, like the immersions, like I know McDougal has the immersions and uh, I think Michael Clapper is a good one too. He has the immersions. Um, I was trying to think, I think I had an, another one in mind but uh so let me go back to to these doctors in the emergency department that you're working with that you're scribing for uh do they understand that what these patients are suffering from is diet and lifestyle related or largely preventable you think do they get the connection i want to say yes but at the same time i'm not entirely sure because i've heard statements um, after a patient's coming up with a kidney stone and they ask uh, the doctor I'm working with, how, how, how do I get these? Like what causes these? And yeah. they say bad luck. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh, okay. It's the um, default. <laughs> it's the easy answer. Yeah. It's, you know, genetics, I, I, that, I've never thought about this, but like saying genetics, it's the easy answer. They're not wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like they're not wrong. <laughs> so, it, but it, but you know, okay. What plays the majority role? for kidney stone you know it's again genetics might be a five or ten maybe but yeah it's i mean some of them eat well some of them are have an idea of what plant-based nutrition is but everyone has an idea of what plant-based nutrition is you eat plant-based foods right but that's unfortunately that's as far as it kind of extends and mm. It's unfortunate because there isn't a platform for that to be a thing to where, you know, in the discharge instructions, it's like, oh, oh you should eat more fruits. You should eat more vegetables mm. instead of the meat and dairy three or four times a day. Yeah. Why don't you switch to whole food plant-based um, foods? Yeah. And, and it's unfortunate because someone comes in, they have a heart attack or they come in with crushing chest pain that they've never had before. That is the most valuable point you have as an educator to help someone change their life around mm. because they feel like they are going to die. Yeah. <laughs> and that is a moment that is that is wasted so many times just because we don't we don't have a system or a process in that specific sense where we can we can make a difference. There just isn't anything set up and people aren't educated in that. That's, you're you're saying in that specific setting yes, of the emergency, in that emergency department, yeah. At that moment, that's that's a huge moment wasted, and unfortunately, I have to see that almost every single day. But I, I mean, let me play devil's advocate for a second. I'm going to be a, a little bit critical and say that, uh, going back to a previous point that I was trying to make, is is that the right environment to bring something like that up? I'm trying to imagine like person just had a heart attack, 48 hours ago, had a had a bypass. And, and I'm just thinking like, I don't know, like, is it insensitive or just not the right time to talk to them about, you know, diet and lifestyle? Do you, I mean, what's your opinion? I feel like, I mean, that's, let me clarify. Mm -hmm. 
the primary care providers and the people that are managing people's lives and medications and seeing them on a regular basis, they need to be the ones that are actively trying to help change the patient's lifestyle. It's not appropriate for an emergency provider to do it, but if <clears throat> someone comes in for crushing chest pain and you have that valuable moment where they're scared for their life and they want to know what to do to fix it, we need to be able to drop the bomb and provide... Um, Plant the seed, yeah. maybe, at least, right? <laughs> yeah, but mm. it isn't really even a setting where that's possible at the moment. Yeah. In terms of education or in terms of the desire of these doctors to even do that or they don't even have the knowledge? I would say a component of all three. There yeah. isn't because it is an emergency room and the doctors are working emergency cases. They're focused on the complete and full like clinical aspect of what's going on, Yeah, which is how to treat it, the medications to do and call whatever service is going to be admitting the patient because we are the grand, the grand triagers essentially. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, all three. It's the education. The I don't want to say desire because there's good people in the yeah. emergency room, yeah. but we'll just say they're not aware of the of they're not aware of that power that they have. Yeah. To essentially plant a seed like that and be like, you really need to change your lifestyle. Yeah. Or else this could happen again. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point about the primary care physicians at how, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, again, every day I'm, I'm trying to reach more and more people in the public, but also medical professionals mm -hmm. with the podcast. And I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of, um, of a primary care. And after med school, I mean, sure, you, you have your, your seat continuing education units or they're, they're called other things from other professions, but um, man, it like if you're stubborn or if you're old school or if you're you you say you know I'm I'm out of med school I'm out of residency I'm doing my thing like I'm just gonna teach people what I learned in school and not really be open minded which mm -hmm. unfortunately you know <laughs> physicians I feel like that's the profession where you need to be the most open minded and the most scientific but I feel like. And again, it's like a it's a human nature thing where you're sort of stuck in your ways. You're you're you just kind of go with the flow and you you do what you learned in school. Yep. Um, and you know, part of it too, I feel like, is ego, where these doctors not necessarily I've heard of the God complex, but I'm not necessarily insinuating that. But they just they don't want to admit that they're wrong. Yeah. And and, and a really really good example of this that I'll publish probably once that when the time once this comes out this podcast will be out. But I just sat down with Barnett, Dr. Campbell, and Carrie Graff. You ever met Carrie Graff or know of her? I've heard of her. She's, she's out of Canandaigua. She's a <clears throat> lifestyle physician, but a really great example of this. If, if, if you're a doctor or a medical professional out there and you want to listen to a story of a doctor who admitted fault, she's like, you know, for 20 years I was treating patients the exact opposite. I was treating patients wrong, and I feel horrible for it. And when she was telling her story on my podcast and uh, a couple weeks ago, she had tears welling up in her eyes. Because, But the, the point I'm trying to make is that it's okay to admit you are wrong. Yeah. As long as from that point forward, you, you're a changed person. You're a better person, and now you're helping the world and helping people and patients in a much better way. Yep. Um, but but that's again that's a human nature thing. But um, hopefully again I, I hope that uh, with open dialogue and uh, and and conveying this message on my episodes of continuing to learn, put the ego aside. We're all human, make mistakes and keep learning. Hopefully we can you know you and I can both slowly change the world for the better mm -hmm. <laughs> here in Rochester. Yeah, absolutely. How about um, let's uh, let's transition here uh, to kind of what you spoke about before with so you know we were talking off microphone a little bit about busy lifestyle you know how you were training so one thing you didn't mention before is cycling your cat one mm -hmm. all right so so remind me too so there's cat one and then there's also a step up from that cat one pro or so it goes directly pro from that. Okay. Um, in the USA cycling setting, most Cat 1s race 
pros almost every race they do if yeah. it's a pro one or which you did you race yeah. with the big boys yeah yeah Def- <laughs> yeah yeah um and it's hard to imagine because you were talking about before how like you know you you just got you got dropped like a bad habit in some races oh my God. and it's hard to believe you know guys talking from personal experience so i'm a cat three and I think we raced a couple times at Larkinville, yeah. I want to say. And so Larkinville is a just a square criterium in Buffalo. And I think that was a cat one, two, three race. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, man, I'm racing with the big boys. <laughs> and seeing the acceleration that both JP and some of the other riders put in was like, oh, like, oh shit. Like, I'm in deep trouble. So to hear you say as a way stronger rider than me that you were you were getting dropped like a bad habit that's unbelievable yeah it's it's definitely eye opening going to going to your first big race you get your cat one you do your first pro one race it is a totally different sport almost mm. when you go and do those races just the dynamic in the field there's a lot more contact there's mm. a lot more going on there's mm. a lot more craziness you got to fight for a position and you have to be able to go significantly harder than you've ever gone before yeah. at many points wow. during the race. That's crazy. So, but you've, you spoke about before how you are spending less time on training because of both your obligations with this emergency medicine stuff mm-hmm. and also your what parrot paratrooper training, military service training. And, and I guess we want, we kind of wanted to talk about you know, not being perfect and, and working and not being, I I guess not being afraid to make mistakes and working and trying to eat well and live a healthy lifestyle while working 60, 70, 80, 80 hours a week. Yeah. It's the time, the timestamp alone, 60 to 80 hours a week is tough Mm. just to eat well. Mm. But then an emergency room setting where you could either sit there and you could be eating food the whole time or you might not be able to look at a water bottle for 12 hours straight. Wow. It just depends. So it's really hard to predict uh, what you're going to be able to do. So I usually always come prepared. I've tried a bunch of different systems, like a bunch of different bars that are really healthy, like nut bars and fruit bars, stuff that I can put in my pocket and just throw in my mouth in the <laughs> less than one minute one minute yeah, setting. Yeah. Um, but it's just hard because you come back and, I mean, the stress level in that environment for 12 hours straight yes it's 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 cool and it's awesome but you get home and i have two a day workouts i have to be doing for this military preparation so i get up early i do that and then i go run around for nine to 12 hours straight yeah and then i come home i do another workout and the last thing i want to do is cook yeah (laughs) so you must be cranking through the calories man that's that's part of the issue too is it's hard to keep up eating enough calories yeah and i always feel it the next day when i go out for a run or a swim it's 10 minutes into it i feel great and then 12 minutes i just the tank's empty yeah it's just like oh no so let's flesh that out a little bit and talk about some strategies not only to people who let's say let's split it up into people who are really busy who are working 60 70 80 hours a week and some strategies for them to just uh, to eat healthy, but also let's talk about the people who are more like you, endurance athletes who are having a hard time getting enough calories from mainly plant-based sources. Mm-hmm. So the things I've been doing in the emergency room setting when I'm working, um, a lot of hours is, it's just more that the the time. So get up at seven in the morning, I do hour and a half workout till like eight eight thirty, shower and I have to be at work by ten. I work ten to ten. Mm. I come home, I do another workout. Mm. Yeah. It's <laughs> um for those days I I just tell myself to I've actually asked a lot of uh emergency physicians what they do and there was one specifically, um at RGH who only eats bars. He eats the same eight bars throughout every shift for the past 20 years. <laughs> so I gave that a try and I picked out eight bars that I really enjoyed. I throw in uh, one really unhealthy um, candy bar at the end sure. for a little reward, but I try to keep it simple. So I do the eight different bars like Nutrigrain bars and Fruit and Nut bars and Lara bars and Cliff bars. and So... How did that work? It 
you kind of have to train your mind to to just accept that you need to put this food in your body not for pleasure but because you don't want to lose your vision from hypoglycemia right so i just i try to keep it simple i just i try to eat a bar every hour and every morning i make black beans i do a can of black beans i do about like a cup of uh, frozen corn some italian dressing because i love my italian dressing yeah and uh, a few tablespoons of yeast flakes okay and that's like one of my go-to meals that i have there and i have two or three pb and j's that simple when when you're busy <laughs> you get to the point where you don't care what you're eating you just need to eat something yeah so i just make it a habit of i almost just turn off that that pleasure center in my brain that's seeking all the the horrible the horribly yummy foods and yeah. I'm just like, I have to eat this. I have to eat this here. So I almost schedule it out to when I'm going to eat stuff. So I have a bar every hour for the first eight hours. And I have, I do the black beans and corn usually about halfway through a shift. So five hours for a nine hour shift. Mm. And then um, uh, six hours for a 10 hour shift. I try to stretch it a little longer. Um, I just, I keep it simple and I schedule it almost like it's a task that I have to check off a checklist. Um and the easy thing about preparation for that is you go home and you just strain some black beans out of a can and you just throw in the frozen corn and you can yeah. take it to work and the frozen corn will kind of keep everything cool mm. so it won't go bad. And then you heat it up in the microwave right there. Yep. Easy. Yeah. Easy. But it's definitely hard coming home and then not having... That's where the fiance has been helping is having some stuff ready. Like we do like... A, potato rice oh, yeah. and brussels sprout wraps all the time oh. just like ground up it's it's really easy for her to make and we just, just shovel it in wow. so hmm. but i yeah and i was gonna add the the starch it sounds to me like my lunches sound very similar now i'm not i'm definitely in a setting where it's kind of like the opposite where i have you know these long periods of boredom uh you know, with, with, with some periods of, okay, I'm seeing a patient every 30 hours for a couple, for a couple hours. And so I have no issues with eating, with sitting down for 30 minutes. In fact, it's sort of mandated, I guess, by U of R. But, um, yeah, the only thing I would add to people is, you know, the starch is mm -hmm. definitely put in a brown rice, um, maybe just scoop, but, but I think the protein and the fiber content of the beans awesome. Like that's pretty filling. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. or, or the potato starch or a quinoa, I'm good on, you know, I, I definitely a quinoa. Mm. That's a huge one. If you can set the time to make a, a good recipe with it and just have it packaged and ready to go, that will keep you full. What if you had never run into or, or spoken to this doctor who eats eight bars, eight of these bars a day? Like, just forget about that for a second. What and, and let's say you weren't doing that. What would be some other options but for busy people to eat food? <laughs> That's relatively healthy. Oh, man. Like fresh fruit or juices or... I would say just... I, I do sometimes, too, where I'll bring in like a small bag of nuts, a small bag of apple slices, a small bag of strawberries. Yep. And you'd, like I said, you almost schedule it to when you're going to eat it. Mm -hmm. And you have... I have one cabinet set up for where I have like my bars and everything lined up that I grab before every shift and I do it the same way every time. I do it in the fridge sometimes too. I have like little tall containers of black beans and corn already in there ready to go that I just pull out. Yep. And that stuff literally takes 20 minutes to set up. It doesn't take long to right. cut apples or throw black beans in a container. Right. So definitely scheduling it out, yeah. keeping it simple because if you're as busy as – as you think you are, your schedule demands that yeah. you're not going to care as much about how it tastes. You're going to just fork it down. Right, right. And I think that's the big thing I know from, again, working in some hospitals and working in medicine is, and again, this is even, this applies to my physical therapy clinic, is um, there are some really bad choices in medical facilities like it's horrible vending machine food oh, man. lots of lots of diet <laughs> soda i know of so i commend you for putting in a little bit of prep time like you said it's not 
it's not overwhelming and and even if it is overwhelming to someone who's starting out once you get it down give it a week or two and you're like okay i got this down to 20 minutes down from an hour of meal prep because i didn't know what i was doing down to 20 minutes maybe here's i i say this to myself maybe that's the price of health so okay so maybe going through a drive through but again if you're in that setting People use, you know, the drive-through as an example. I'm, I'm in a hurry, blah blah blah. Sure, going through the drive-through may be quicker, but it ain't very healthy. Yeah. So you got to put in a little bit of prep time to cook up some simple foods, put them in a Tupperware. Maybe that's the price of health. Yeah. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend like I'm perfect. There has no. been plenty of times where I've gone through the drive-through sure. after a long day where I get home and I just don't want to cook, and it's, it's convenient, it's easy. Yep. But it definitely, in the sense where you're very busy, you're not going to necessarily care what you're eating. You're just going to have to throw something down your throat. Yep. Why not make it healthy? True. Because you're not going to be focused on the taste or the flavor. Yeah. Almost all the bars towards the end of the shift, I, I don't even remember that <laughs> I ate some of them or I look in the bag and I was like, uh, what bar am I on? Right. Yeah. Well, there are, I mean, so for people who are living a busy lifestyle... Um, I like to throw some ideas at them for healthier options. If if they do, let's say, have a lunch where they're busy lifestyle, but they have a lunch, and I know up here on um, Mount Hope, right adjacent to uh, Strong Hospital, there's a, a Moe's and a Chipotle mm -hmm. that I go there. I, I go there maybe like once or twice a month if yep. I'm if I'm you know not in a hurry, in a hurry, but maybe forgot to pack my lunch, but. There is some – you can still get something quick that's healthy. Yeah. That's what's cool about those places is you can get a meal that's super healthy mm -hmm. or you can get a meal that's equivalent to a McDonald's. Right. <laughs> At, under one roof. <laughs> and you know what's too is, again, the last time – I couldn't tell you the last time I was in or drove through a McDonald's or a Wendy's or a Burger King. But I, I want to say that they are – recognizing that people want healthier options yeah. and that they're they're stocking, you know, more salads, maybe like hold the dressing or I know um several years ago I was going through the airport in Rochester and they had I I got breakfast at McDonald's it was a oatmeal mm -hmm. dish. Yeah. So be a detective and try to make things as healthy as possible. A lot of the times you can find some pretty healthy options at these places. Yeah. Um, I know there's a Tim Hortons right by Unity I work at, and they have an oatmeal with fresh raisins and berries in it. Perfect. It's pretty good. How I many mean... orders of magnitude healthier is that than Munchkins? Right? Is it Munchkins, I think? Uh, there it's Timbits. the Timbits. Timbits. Yeah. <laughs> um, or donuts, or even like, you know, bagels and stuff yeah. like that, refined carbohydrates. Go for it. Oh. It's so much better for your body, but yeah. it's not as appetizing to the soul, obviously. True, but true. Um, but you know, I, I, one of the main, one of the things I think about is um, at this stage, seven years in, uh, early on, I wanted to be kind of that perfectionist, and I said I, I really want to abstain from animal products, kind of more for like, I wanted to show myself that I could do this. But now, it's more, it's, it's transition to more of I just don't feel good like if I have a dish that like if I eat out and I have a dish even there's no animal products and it's like really oily um or really perhaps refined I just don't feel well yeah so so it's those little oatmeal and the and the beans and the corn and the whole plant foods they just make me feel better and they give me this sustained energy for if you're you know like you four or five six hours before your next meal kind of thing yeah, for the majority of the weekday when I'm working Monday through Friday, sometimes Saturday, it's those aren't the days where I'm worried about <laughs> eating healthy because I'm on that schedule and I'm literally just forcing the food that I pull out of the fridge down that I've pre-prepared and I have set up and ready to go. It's the times where you come home and there's nothing prepared. Yeah. That's where it's that's where it's hard for me. Yeah. So what do you do? Suck it up sometimes, or cave other times like i said i'm not perfect but um the thing i'm trying to fight right now is even the time to go to the grocery store it, it stinks you need a personal <laughs> assistant if groceries could be delivered and stocked 
Well, they can be delivered these days, right? Oh yeah, but it's, it's, it's only money, right? Yeah, man, that's uh, that's that's what's unfortunate about the setup right now. Thankfully, it's not forever, but just for the next few months, as uh, the company hires some more people, and I don't have to work as much, mm-hmm. or the hour shifts I'm working, I can go back to the nines instead of the tens and the twelves, because mm-hmm. those three hours make a huge difference. Yeah, it makes it it makes a long day even longer. Um, yeah. Is there anything else? Is there anything else you wanted to, uh, to bring up? Like anything that you wanted the talking points, bullet points in particular, we can kind of, you know, it can be related. It can be totally unrelated. Oh man. There's a lot, there's a lot of topics we can talk about. (laughs) You know what I thought, just so I have it on my mind, you can think about that is, you know what I thought, depending on, um, how much work this is to edit it and upload it. The biggest thing for me is just it takes like three hours to upload these movies to YouTube, yeah. but is I thought that it would be interesting as two endurance athletes who are psych, who, who are also plant-based. There's a group on Facebook called plant-based endurance athletes, I think. Okay. And there's always really good questions on there and there's a lot of comments, but I don't feel like being, I don't feel like commenting at comment number 32 because they're a, they're never going to read it. But I thought it would be really interesting to uh, maybe just you know have it both on our phones and flip through, you know, ten, ten of ten the first ten questions, and maybe we could even have Matt here too. Yeah. Um, and just like have a conversation, and maybe we could say like, hey, plant based endurance athlete group on Facebook. We took, you know, on this particular day, we took the first 10 questions, and in our personal experience, here's the way we would do it. Yeah. I don't know. Like, it just seems fun. We could do that. So he comes back around Thanksgiving time, I believe. From where? Uh, Because he's in North Carolina now. Doing what? Working as a scribe, and so his goal is to go to med school out there, but he wants to get in-state residency Mm. because it's significantly cheaper. Oh, good for him. Yeah. Yeah. So he's got the right idea. Now, you, you two both went to uh, Lindenwood, right? Is it Lindenwood? Yep. Lindenwood University. In St. Louis. Yeah. Nice. We've uh, we've been a dynamic duo for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so he, he and I sat down at... Um, Boulder, right? Boulder. Yeah. Boulder Coffee. Yeah, yeah. For uh, That was like in March where we just got a lot of snowfall. But um, he's a cat one too, yep. correct? Yeah. Yeah, he's fast. <laughs> Faster than you? And... Almost every setting, yes. It's hard to believe. Except for, uh, except for sprinting, but sprinting, yeah. Pretty much everything else. So climbing, he's got a climber's body. Yep. Hmm. Breakaway bro is what we used to Breakaway used to call bro-f. him. Good for him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I like I spoke about before, I think the I think my racing days are over, but group rides, sign me up. You yeah. know, maybe the ultra endurance. Uh, you ever have any interest? I mean, again, maybe five, ten, fifteen years down the road. Um, of doing like I could see you doing a a, fi- a twelve or a twenty four hour endurance, uh, it's like a bike race, like as many oh, miles man. as many miles as you can cover in twelve or twenty four hours. I don't know if I'd do a cycling event specific to that, but I I would probably do like a run or you swim, you run, you hike, something like that. I would mm-hmm. definitely do like an all day event. I don't know, maybe a mountain bike because mountain biking is very enjoyable. Mm. But road cycling, my issue with uh, cycling personally, it's hard for me to train because I don't enjoy just going out and just kind of cruising around. Yeah. I like training hard or racing hard. Or, you like to have so an it's... event an event on the calendar yes. and say, I yes. am training for this event. Yeah. I'm the same way. And, and it's been, it's taken me 18 months to kind of retrain my brain and, yeah. and, 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 and admit to myself, like, it's okay to hop on the trainer for half an hour and not be training for anything. Yep. It's okay. Yep. Um, it's just my competitive nature. Yeah. You know, I'm sure um, I'm sure you understand at some point. Yep. All right. Let's um let's call it let's uh let's wrap it up. Sounds good. Let's wrap it up and uh, we'll publish it. It'll be on YouTube and I hope to get uh, hope to use these facilities and this equipment more for future conversations like this. So thanks JP. Thanks yeah. so much. Thanks Ian. I appreciate it.